Welcome to the second and final day of our symposium on Berlin and the Cold War. I'm Seth Givens, historian of the Marine Corps History Division and co-organizer with Ingo Trauschweitzer, who's director of the Contemporary History and Ohio University's Baker Peace Study Program. Thanks also to the Allied Museum Berlin and the Berlin Center for Cold War Studies for their assistance. Yesterday, we examined the first decade of the Cold War, a tumultuous period for Berlin. Our panelists presented on U.S. defense planning for the city, the U.S. occupation of both the Western sectors of Berlin and West Germany, and the ways in which the 1953 East German uprising in the Eastern sectors of Berlin was a Cold War crisis. Yesterday's panels on YouTube and the Contemporary History Institute's Facebook page, and I encourage anyone to reference it if interested. We continue today where we left off yesterday, examining key aspects of a global event, the Cold War, through the lens of one city, Berlin. This next panel focuses on the second period of crisis in Berlin, which began in 1958 due to a lack of answers to the German question and unresolved issues from the previous crisis. Do, um, the Berlin Wall crisis in August 1961 and a showdown between Soviet and American tanks at Checkpoint Charlie two months later created enduring images of the city's division and the tenuous nature of conflict and peace in the Cold War. This panel considers diplomacy and alliance politics during that period. It begins with the decision to erect the Berlin Wall and ends with the four power attempts 10 years later to make Berlin a less contested space in the Cold War. For the sake of flow between presentations, I'll introduce the panelists now and then we'll pass the baton between each speaker. So if any of you in the audience have questions, please feel free to pose them in the chat functions of whichever platform you're viewing, um, YouTube or Facebook. We will then relay them to our speakers after the presentations during a 20 to 25 minute long uh, question and answer session. Their first panelist is Dr. Hope M. Harrison. Dr. Harrison's professor of history and international affairs at the George Washington University and the author of two books on the Berlin Wall, Driving the Soviets Up the Wall, Soviet East German Relations, 1953 to 1961, and After the Berlin Wall, Memory in the Making of a, the New Germany, 1989 to the Present. She's the recipient of fellowships from Fulbright, the Nobel Institute in Oslo, the American Academy in Berlin, Harvard, and the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. She serves on the board of three institutions in Berlin connected to the Cold War and the Berlin Wall and has been uh, featured widely in the media, including on CNN, C-SPAN, the BBC, the History Channel, and Deutschland Radio. Dr. Harrison's paper is titled East German-Soviet Relations and the Decision to Erect the Berlin Wall. Our second panelist is Dr. Aaron Mahan. Dr. Mahan is Chief Historian in the Office of the Secretary of Defense at the U.S. Department of Defense. She's also an adjunct professor for the School of International Service at American University and a non-resident senior fellow at the Miller Center of Public Affairs at the University of Virginia. She's the author of Kennedy, De Gaulle in Western Europe and has published several chapters and articles on a variety of topics, including biological and chemical, chemical weapons, NATO, World War I, and World War II. Her forthcoming co-authored book entitled Averting Doomsday, Arms Control During the Nixon Presidency, will be released by the University of Virginia Press in November 2021. Dr. Mahan's paper is titled The Never-Ending Problem of Berlin, Kennedy, De Gaulle, and the Limits of Alliance Politics. Our final panelist is Dr. Thomas A. Schwartz. Dr. Schwartz is the Distinguished Professor of History and Professor of Political Science and European Studies at Vanderbilt University. He was educated at Columbia, Oxford, and Harvard Universities, and is the author of three books, uh, Henry Kissinger and American Power, a Political Biography, Lyndon Johnson in Europe and the Shadow of Vietnam, and America's Germany, John J. McCloy and the Federal Republic of Germany. He has received fellowships from the German Historical Institute, the Norwegian Nobel Institute, the Woodrow Wilson Center, and the Science, Social Science Research Council. The title for Dr. Schwartz's presentation is Between Freedom's Symbol and Causes Belly, Berlin and the Johnson and Nixon years. So ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Hope M. Harrison. Dr. Harrison, you're on mute. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you particularly to Ingo and Sven for inviting an, me and organizing this. And it's great to be on the same panel with Aaron and Tom. Uh, one of the institutions I'm on the board of in Berlin is indeed the Allied Museum. So I'm very happy to hear that they have been involved in um, uh, supporting this. 
I am going to open uh, my slides, share my slides. Um, can someone please confirm that you're able to see my slides? We can confirm, yes. Great, thank you so much. All right, well, I think that um, Berlin really had a unique place in the Cold War. Uh, I don't think there is a city or a place that occupies quite um, the place that Berlin did in, in the Cold War, this one place where people feared World War III could break out and where there were regular risks of that happen, happening. One was, of course, the first Berlin crisis we spoke about yesterday, the Berlin blockade and airlift of 1948 to 49. Um, then again, with the uprising in East Germany in 1953, it was unclear what might happen there. And now today, talking about the second Berlin crisis um, that went from 1958 to 61 and culminated in the building of the wall. The fact that West Berlin was 110 miles inside of East Germany uh, influenced um, all the history of that city after World War II um, and arguably um, contributed to the collapse of East Germany in 1989 because there was this uh, Western exclave of freedom and democracy, namely West Berlin, right in the middle of communist East Germany. The only place that perhaps um, in, in our times now still has this kind of role may be Taiwan, um, but of course there aren't Western troops um, occupying um, and being right up next to, in that case, Chinese troops. But that part of the world is um, certainly perhaps some sort of analogy to what we're talking about with Berlin during the Cold War. Um, <clears throat> and of course, we know that um, the Western powers were able to get from the Western sectors of Germany to the Western sectors of Berlin by railroads, by highways, and by the air corridor. Now, in 1952, um, uh, Stalin ordered that the big border, near, nearly a thousand miles long between East Germany and West Germany, be closed down. So that meant that after 1952, the only place for really free movement of East and West Germans back and forth was in Berlin. My comments today have two bookends. The first will be shortly after Stalin's death in 1953, when uh, <clears throat> the Soviets rejected an East German request to seal the border. Um, and I will end, of course, with the building of the wall in uh, August of 1961. So uh, in March of 1953, about two weeks after Stalin died, uh, his successors responded to Walter Ulbricht's request to close the border in Berlin, telling him that this was politically unacceptable and grossly simplistic. They said it would negatively affect the interests of all Berliners, including economically, and it would make the citizens of Berlin uh, bitter and um, dissatisfied, to say the least, if not angry, uh, with the East German and Soviet regimes. Uh, the Soviets also said it would be technically very difficult, um, and they really didn't even think um, you could close off um, uh, the city or divide the city um, by closing the border between East and West Berlin. And finally, so soon after Stalin's death, when the new leaders were trying to figure out 
what their policies were going to be. They certainly did not want to complicate relations with the West, which um, making some unilateral move in four power occupied Berlin certainly would have complicated relations with the West. So I'm going to talk uh, at multiple points um, this morning about the importance of East German leader Walter Ulbricht. Um, he had been uh, trained in the Soviet Union uh, at the Lenin School um, once the Nazis came to power and he went into exile since the Communist Party was outlawed and uh, people were put in prisons and in concentration camps, he instead left and went to the Soviet Union. So um, during the period the Nazis were in power and World War II, Ulbricht was um, in the Soviet Union, as were other communist leaders from Central Europe uh, being trained and, of course, having safe haven uh, in the Soviet Union. His personality was very hard line, um, Stalinist type of personality, really cared about his own power and was not interested in anything that would challenge his power um, or challenge the stability of communism in East Germany. Uh, he survived two attempts to oust him in the 1950s. First, in the wake of the night, well, yeah, in the wake of the 1953 uprising, um, there the Soviets backed um, a couple of other more flexible East German leaders um, to try to have a more stable course. Uh, but uh, ultimately, the Soviets gave up on this and felt better not change horses midstream and kept him in power in 1953. The same thing happened in 1956. Uh, Ulbricht did not agree with Khrushchev's reforms, his talks of peaceful coexistence with the West, of ending a cult of personality. Um, and again, high level opposition to Ulbricht uh, in the form of Karl Schurtevan and Ernst Wollweber, backed by the Soviets again, um, seemed that he might uh, be ousted. But again, he prevailed and instead uh, ousted his opposition. So that by the time the Berlin crisis, the second Berlin crisis began in 1958, he had consolidated his power. And I argue that he ultimately was able to have significant influence over the Soviets and in fact push them really against their will to agree to seal off the border in Berlin um, due to two particular uh, reasons. His ongoing persistent and independent behavior, ignoring Soviet uh, entreaties um, to reform and to uh, try to make East Germany more attractive so its citizens weren't fleeing to the West. Um, and secondly, uh, he was able to have important influence because of the strategic importance of a communist East Germany to the Soviet Union. Now, um, particularly important here are the long-term effects of the 1956 uprising in Hungary and its uh, crushing uh, by Soviet military forces the effects of that on East Germany. Uh, the fact that during the unrest in Poland and Hungary, Ulbricht had, able, had been able to keep things uh, quiet in East Germany um, and did not see major demonstrations as there were in Poland and Hungary um, helped to secure his power. It also helped him to say, look, other, look what happens when other countries have tried reforms. We are on the border with NATO. It is too risky.
risky for East Germany with its open border with West Germany and NATO to engage in any uh, reforms, including uh, really peaceful coexistence, um, which Khrushchev had um, touted. Um, there also, after the Hungarian uprising, was an increased focus on security in East Germany, um, which led to an expansion of the Stasi, the secret police to root all enemies, and yet again reminded the Soviets of how important uh, it was to, to keep East Germany securely in the bloc. Uh, a very specific outcome of the Hungarian uh, uprising and violence um, was that Ulbricht decided that the East German leaders themselves needed to be made safe because in Hungary, some of the communist leaders, um, some communist officials were killed by angry citizens. So to make sure that couldn't happen in East Germany, between 1958 and 1960, um, they built a walled-in compound for all the top leaders to live in, uh, surrounded by um, a wall painted green, just trying to blend in with the forest. This was on no map. Uh, all a map showed was um, um, a nature, res nature preserve and research area. Uh, by the summer of 1960, the East German leaders were moving in to their walled compound um, about half an hour north of Berlin. And this is sort of a prelude. First, they walled in themselves, and in 1961, they would um, continue walling in the country and their own citizens. Uh, now, Nikita Khrushchev, on the other hand, the Soviet leader, was a very different type of leader than Ulbricht. Um, uh, Khrushchev really was um, an enthusiastic, true believer in communism and um, particularly felt the importance of winning the battle between communism and capitalism or democracy in East Germany. Uh, his optimism sort of was played against um, Khrushchev, um, Ulbricht's pragmatic realism uh, in, in, at multiple moments. Now, the situation of divided Berlin with West Berlin in the middle of communist East Germany, of course, offered challenges and opportunities both to the communists and to the West. So for the communists, uh, of course, West Berlin was a challenge. Khrushchev um, called it a bone in my throat um, because it lured East Germans away to prosperity and freedom. It was a loophole in the border. Um, and of course, it was spy central um, for the West. On the other hand, there were obviously opportunities uh, which Stalin had used by blockading Berlin um, in 10 years before. You could use it to pressure, to the, pressure the West to make concessions. Um, in his polite moments, Khrushchev called it the Achilles heel of the West. In his more um, unfettered, unleashed moments, uh, he called West Berlin the testicles of the West. Uh, for the West, which of course the next speaker, Aaron Mahan, I'm sure we'll talk about, um, a big challenge. It could not be defended with conventional forces. Um, there was no way access was going to be guaranteed if the Soviets really um, blocked it off. Uh, there was also a sense that West Berlin was not just a domino for the U.S., but really a super domino. Um, you give that up and um, you might risk losing West Germany and other allies in Western Europe. Another challenge was the Western allies disagreed on how important West Berlin was and how much they should risk to keep it free. 
On the opportunities side for the West, of course, it was a great place to spy on the Soviet bloc and a fantastic way to uh, display the superiority of capitalism and democracy. So what began the crisis was an ultimatum from Nikita Khrushchev in November of 1958. He set a six month deadline. He demanded of the Western powers that a peace treaty finally be signed after World War II with either a united Germany or the two Germanys. And he demanded that West Berlin be transformed into what he called a free city, meaning demilitarized um, uh, and meaning the Western troops must leave. Um, or else, uh, he said he would sign a separate peace treaty with East Germany and would turn over control of the access routes between West Germany and West Berlin to Walter Ulbricht. Now, everybody knew that would mean that Ulbricht would try to shut down those access routes so that he could stop his own citizens from leaving. Um, so Khrushchev had a variety of motivations, which I have um, put up here from uh, solidifying the East German regime, getting the West out of West Berlin, showing conservatives at home and in China that he was a tough on imperialists, being seen as equal with the US on the world stage and forcing a split in NATO. The crisis was multiple crises. The one I'm going to talk about particularly, it's not so much the broader East-West crisis, but particularly that there was also a crisis between the Soviets and the East Germans as this went on. Um, uh, by the time uh, the Berlin Wall would be built, over 3 million people had fled. Um, uh, and this was, of course, what um, the East German leader wanted to stop. So the conflict um, that would develop between the Soviets and the East Germans uh, with the Soviet ambassador, um, Per Buchen, in East Berlin playing a rather interesting role in all of this and really <clears throat> generally taking Ulbricht's side of uh, it being a problem that the border was open um, because it made people from the East um, not feel so good about the situation in communist East Germany. Um, <clears throat> there were different interests of the superpowers and their German allies on the urgency of the Berlin issue, on how much they should negotiate, and on their willingness to, uh, to risk war. Uh, the West gave in to Khrushchev's ultimatum and held um, um, negotiations of the four powers at the foreign minister level in the summer of 1959. East and West Germans were even allowed to attend and sit on the side, which seemed like Khrushchev was getting somewhere given that East Germany was allowed to be there. During these talks, Western allies openly considered reducing their presence in West Berlin. Uh, but the talks ended without anything conclusive, and Khrushchev was invited to visit the United States, which, of course, he saw as a huge victory. Um, a Soviet leader had not been to the United States before, and Khrushchev was absolutely ecstatic about this, traveling around the country from the White House to Camp David to Hollywood to a corn farm in Iowa. President Eisenhower even recognized that the situation in Berlin was abnormal, which of course made Khrushchev feel he was getting somewhere. Um, but uh, it left um, the East German leader, Walter Ulbricht, very frustrated because Khrushchev um, still was not willing to carry out his threats from November of 1958 um, to sign a separate peace treaty and um, also assure Ulbricht that he would help him stop the refugee exodus. Uh, so 
in the summer of 1960, the four powers met in Paris. Um, the only problem there was that right before that, the Soviets had shot down a U-2 plane flying over the Soviet Union to find out how many missiles did he really have, because throughout the crisis, Khrushchev kept saying things like, you know, we are rolling missiles out like sausages. Um, uh, and then the Soviets announced that not only had they downed the plane, but they had the pilot, Francis Gary Powers. When the four powers met in Paris, Khrushchev insisted that Eisenhower apologize for this, but Eisenhower refused, and Khrushchev stormed out of the summit. Now, this led Ulbricht to say, basically, I told you so, you can't trust the West, let me close the border. We need to close the border. But Khrushchev kept dragging his feet. So Ulbricht began, and in the final year before the building of the wall, began some unilateral action on the border between the East and West Berlin, making it harder for Western diplomats to enter East Berlin, making them uh, show ID to East German officials, which they were not supposed to do. Um, with Berlin under four power control, the East Germans were not supposed to play a role in that. Uh, the Soviets were astonished that Ulbricht was doing this on his own and that they hadn't consulted the Soviets and insist that he stop. Um, one of the ministers at the Soviet embassy in East Berlin cabled back to Moscow in October. Our friends, the East Germans, are studying the possibility of taking measures directed towards stopping the exodus of the population of the GDR through West Berlin. Um, one of such measures could be the cessation of free movement through the sectoral border. And in his last sentence, he basically says, you need to talk to Ulbricht and get him to stop this. Um, but, you know, Ulbricht kept up his sort of confident criticism of Khrushchev's foot dragging um, and wrote him a letter um, being very critical, saying that Khrushchev had an unnecessary toleration of the Western unwillingness to recognize East Germany. So in November of 1960, when Kennedy was elected, um, Khrushchev said to Ulbricht, you really can't do anything at the border. I'm sounding out Kennedy. I'm trying to set up talks. Don't do anything in the meantime. Uh, needless to say, um, Ulbricht was not inspired to agree to that, and the Soviet ambassador again in December uh, cabled Moscow about East German unilateral measures trying to limit movement between East and West Berlin. Now, in the final year, 1961, in January, Ulbricht formed a Politburo commission tasked with finding a way to stop the refugee exodus. And in a lengthy letter to Khrushchev, uh, Ulbricht blamed the Soviets, um, basically comparing the fact that the West had had Marshall Plan aid instead uh, the Soviets had continued to take reparations from East Germany and therefore the East German economy was still lagging behind that of West Germany. And as you can see here, that was his argument to Khrushchev, basically people are leaving for economic reasons and it's your fault. Now, of course, people were leaving for not just economic reasons. They also wanted uh, other kinds of freedom uh, in the West. Uh, while waiting for um, scheduling a date with Kennedy, um, Khrushchev uh, really felt that the Bay of Pigs fiasco made Kennedy weak, and he hoped that would help um, Khrushchev's negotiating strategy. 
um, shortly before um, the Vienna summit between Khrushchev and Kennedy, when Khrushchev had said, I am about to meet with Kennedy, don't do anything to mess this. Um, again, the Soviet ambassador cabled Moscow and talked about East German impatience and a unilateral approach, wanting to stop free movement in Berlin as soon as possible by any means. At the Vienna summit in June of 1961, the two did not agree. Um, Kennedy put forward his three essentials, um, focusing on access to West Berlin, life in West Berlin, and the troops in West Berlin, saying interrupting any of these would be a cause for war. But Kennedy did not say anything about East Berlin or movement between East and West Berlin. Uh, Khrushchev renewed his ultimatum at the Vienna summit, um, which led to, you know, fears worldwide. You know, is World War III going to break out now? Uh, the two superpowers can't agree. Uh, for Ulbricht, there was a massive increase in the refugee exodus um, in the wake of the failed summit. Over 1,000 East Germans were leaving from East Berlin to West Berlin every day. So following the failed summit, Khrushchev sent his closest advisor, Anastas Mikoyan, here on the right, to East Berlin. And Mikoyan expressed um, Khrushchev's views of how absolutely essential East Germany was and communism was there, saying it's the westernmost outpost of the socialist camp. We cannot and must not lose out to West Germany. If socialism does not win in the GDR, if communism does not prove itself as superior and vital there, then we have not won. So basically the whole reputation of communism was on the line um, in East Berlin. Uh, by by mid-July, Ulbricht told the Soviets if the present situation of the open borders remains, collapse of his regime is inevitable. So around July 20th, after eight years of refusing East German requests to close the border in Berlin, the Soviets agreed. Um, as Soviet General Mareshko later said, it was fairly easy to carry out the plans to call it, close the border since Ulbricht had already raised the issue many times with Khrushchev. But for a long time, Khrushchev didn't want to take this step. The East German authorities, however, were well on the way with their preparatory work. So the Warsaw Pact um, stood behind the decision. And on uh, the early morning hours of Sunday, August 13th, Operation Rose began, sealing the border, first with barbed wire and then with cement bricks. Um, surrounding West Berlin so that you, East Germans and East Berliners could not get there. Khrushchev told Ulbricht, you did an extraordinary job. West German intelligence said there's an atmosphere of euphoria among the leaders in East Berlin. President Kennedy privately said to his advisors, a wall is a hell of a lot better than a war. So the, the border was built up into a massive death strip um, over the next year. Uh, there was again a crisis at Checkpoint Charlie when uh, Ulbricht kept up his old effort to make it more difficult for Western officials to enter East Berlin. Um, in particular, the Deputy Chief of Mission, Alan Leitner from the United States. Uh, in response, the U.S. called up tanks, the Soviets responded, and there were 10 tanks standing off there for 16 hours until they withdrew. Um, so to conclude, um, there were a variety of sources of East German influence or power over the Soviets. 
Uh, one was Khrushchev's commitment to socialism winning um, in Germany. Uh, another was uh, Ulbricht um, exercising, using the weakness, the fear of collapse of his regime as a form of strength in bargaining with the Soviets. Uh, Ulbricht's motivation and persistence in pushing to close the border, his willingness to act unilaterally, um, sometimes his playing the China card and um, China agreeing with him that Khrushchev was being too light on the West, um, and also the Soviet unwillingness to use their military power in political and economic contexts with the East German leaders. Uh, Khrushchev learned from this, hey, we did it. We created a fait accompli with the West. We were prepared in secret. They didn't stop us. So the following year, he tried the same thing with missiles in Cuba, but of course that didn't turn out at all the same. On the other hand, Khrushchev also learned Ulbricht is unpredictable. So um, given that Khrushchev wanted to retain for himself um, the power to control the level of risk in Berlin, he did not turn over control of the access routes to the East German leader. Um, over the next 28 years that the wall stood, 140 people were killed at the wall, hundreds more at the inner German border. Um, tens of thousands of people were arrested while planning or trying to escape. Uh, until the unexpected opening of the wall in November of 1989. Thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to hearing um, my colleagues' presentations. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Uh, Dr. Mahan? Uh, thank you, Seth. This is my first virtual conference. Um, I have used the platform frequently, but um, can everyone see, can you see me and hear me okay? Okay. Yes. All right. Um, well, I want to thank you, Seth, and I want to thank Ingo and, and all those who helped make this um, conference the transition from what we had all hoped would be an in-person opportunity to, to talk once again about Berlin, um, because it's a real honor to be on um, on a panel with Hope and, and Tom, um, both of whom were kind of the senior scholars in the field when I was embarking on my own research into the Berlin crisis. Um, so it's it's a pleasure to be here with them, even virtually this morning. Um, and thank you, Ingo. Thank you, Seth. Um, like you, Seth, I must preface my remarks here and during the question and answer um, period with the disclaimer that the views I'm about to express are my own and do not um, necessarily reflect those of the United States Department of Defense or the United States government. Um, so as you know, the title of my talk this morning is The Never-Ending Problem of Berlin, Kennedy, De Gaulle, and the Limits of Alliance Politics. Um, during the early 1960s, numerous security questions weighed heavily on the Western Allied leaders, and the building of the Berlin Wall and the follow-on problem of Western access kept the possibility of war in Central Europe at the forefront of every NATO leader's mind. So what I'm going to examine here today is how the Berlin crisis of the early 1960s became the looking glass, so to speak, that distorted Franco-American perceptions about the most effective NATO strategies for the continent. And what I'm going to focus on is really more the consequences and aftermath of the building of the wall and not the crisis per se. Um, in some respects, I think to even call the problem of Berlin a crisis is somewhat of a misnomer, because after all, as we heard yesterday in, um, in, in Hope's presentation, access and other occupation issues had existed in the former German capital since the end of World War II. And as we heard Hope um, discuss in her presentation, Soviet harassments and threats to end Western access to Berlin were not a new phenomenon. 
um, but the previous flashpoint of the blockade of 1948 was before the perils of the nuclear age. Um, so the problem of Berlin festered for another decade until the until beginning in November 58, NATO faced that renewed predicament, which Hope also described about um, the renewal of this threat of Khrushchev to sign a separate peace treaty with the GDR that would in effect force the NATO powers out of West Berlin. And that 58 crisis passed and then Khrushchev resurrected it again with Kennedy at their summit in Vienna in early June 61. Now the Soviet signing of a separate peace treaty with the GDR would not by itself mean war. Um, Hope explained this with her usual eloquence um, in talking about the GDR and Soviet positions. So suffice it for me to say here then that the Western allies simply believed that it would be East German interference with allied access to Berlin backed by Soviet power, which could part, um, possibly spark a war. Now, quite frankly, the narrative of Kennedy's approach to Berlin has generated hundreds of accounts from almost every angle. And I'm, of course, pleased that some of my own scholarship on this subject, which draws not only on US sources, um, including the JFK presidential recordings, but also, from docu but also documents from France, West Germany, and the UK have helped shape that historiography that illustrates how the West European powers played a role in shaping the contours of the Cold War as it played out in Europe. While it's tempting to try to challenge the dichotomy that posits the diametrically opposed visions of Anglo-American Atlanticism versus a Franco-Gaullist um, vision, I find that there's really insufficient documentary evidence to support other narratives. Now that's not to say that British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan or West German Chancellor Conrad Adenauer were passive actors, far from it. But the reality is that Britain was largely preoccupied with its bid to join the common market and at a time when de Gaulle was exerting pressure on Adenauer to oppose negotiations with the Soviets over Berlin, Macmillan backed backed by JFK, hoped that Britain's entrance into the EEC would offset French influence on West Germany. Adenauer had long supported a unified Western Europe, but he was greatly disturbed by what he feared was Macmillan's apparent willingness to sell out West Germany for peace with the Soviet Union in Central Europe over the question of Berlin. And the chancellor was increasingly disturbed by Kennedy's calls to revise NATO nuclear strategy by an increased reliance on conventional military capabilities, or what is widely now known as flexible response. Adenauer was willing to entertain then de Gaulle's conception of a little Europe, which excluded Britain, if de Gaulle were to maintain a hardline stance against negotiating with the Soviets over Berlin. But let me focus in my limited time here this morning, pr primarily on Kennedy and de Gaulle. Um, so let's start with the U.S. position, which was largely shared by the British. The Kennedy administration viewed Berlin as a test of Western credibility because it was the one place, the one hotspot, where all the major powers had vested interests. Before the wall even went up, the U.S. worried that the, that the Kremlin sought to generate dissension among the Western powers by demanding a different status for Berlin and then would capitalize on that disunity to oust the Western powers somehow from Berlin. Um, Kennedy's Secretary of State, Dean Rusk, warned of the, quote, crucial role that France plays in that dialogue with the Soviet Union on Berlin. Rusk feared that de Gaulle might pursue an independent line that would encourage the Kremlin to take a divide and conquer approach toward abrogating Western rights in Berlin. Now, for my contribution to the book that will come out of this conference, I intend, to go, I intend to go into greater detail about the Kennedy administration's contingency planning responses, both within the U.S. government and with the NATO allies, through what was called um, Live Oak planning. Um, in a nutshell, because I don't have a lot of time here, I'll just say that the Kennedy administration's contingency planning proceeded primarily along two tracks. One, a grafted Berlin task force onto the NSC and an interdepartmental um, coordinating group 
headed by former Secretary of State Dean Acheson, who had managed the Berlin blockade of the, 19, of the late 1940s. Before the wall went up in 61, Acheson, um, Acheson's hardline group seemed to dominate, advocating preemptive military measures such as calling up the reserves, increasing uh, conventional forces in Europe, conducting troop exercises, resuming nu nuclear testing and U-2 flights, increasing the defense budget, and declaring a state of nas national emergency. Most importantly, Acheson made it unequivocally clear that the U.S. should defend the status quo, if necessary, in Berlin with nuclear weapons, a position that sparked, as you can imagine, heated debate within the Kennedy administration. JFK, who had hoped for coherent advice that would allow him to modulate the U.S. response, instead heard only a cacophony of voices from his so-called best and brightest. Walt Rostow, for instance, hardly a dove, criticized taking such a hardline position without stating a political objective, which would justify, in his words, quote, incinerating the world over access to Berlin. And Kennedy's influential national security advisor, McGeorge uh, Bundy, agreed that, quote, nuclear weapons should not be pursued. Now, Atchison's stance of placing primary emphasis on a nuclear deterrent, which increasingly lost ground within the Kennedy circle, um, resonated strongly with de Gaulle and with Adenauer. And I'll explain um, that reasoning in a minute. But when the East Germans began erecting those barriers in the stealth of the early morning hours of August 13th, 1961, Kennedy is alleged to have felt a mixture of shock and relief um, supposedly exclaiming privately to his aides, the now famous quote, which Hope also quoted, of why would Khrushchev put up a wall if he really intended to seize Berlin? This is his way out of a predicament. It's not a very nice solution, but it's a hell of a lot better than war. Um, now, I, I've, never, I've not heard such sentiments expressed by JFK in his many um, privately taped presidential recordings, but then again, most of his Berlin meetings um, involved larger number of participants. So it's very likely that he did express something like that as an aside to one of his uh, confidants. As for de Gaulle, um, he did not advocate destroying the wall. He publicly supported Washington, but privately scorned Kennedy's dispatch of 1,200 troops down the Audubon under the command of General Lucius Clay, the hero of the Berlin blockade of 48. While the U.S. wanted to use the troop dispatch to test whether Khrushchev would actually cut off Western access, de Gaulle thought it was an unnecessary provocation. And, and I want to turn now to the larger effects of the Berlin problem on the NATO alliance. For the Kennedy administration, the ensuing Berlin crisis, or the ongoing Berlin crisis is really the more accurate expression, catapulted NATO's strategy ahead of other European concerns including plans for expanding the common market through Great Britain's admission. Kennedy believed that the immediate threat to Berlin required defining NATO's nuclear posture and preparing for armed combat short of a full-scale nuclear attack. In the event that the Soviets tried to block Western access to Berlin, NATO, in his mind, needed sufficient conventional ground forces and arms um, backed by sea and airlift to counter a Soviet conventional arms threat. The ongoing crisis also led to US demands on France and the other major West European allies for conventional military capabilities on the continent. Kennedy, who had campaigned on a platform of personal sacrifice, extended his clarion call for burden sharing beyond the nation's borders to ask not what the United States could do for Western Europe, but what Western Europe could do for the United States in its common fight against international communism. Now, de Gaulle, as you might imagine, resented U.S. calls for conventional weapons buildup. In a private memorandum circulated amongst his advisors, he fumed that a war over Berlin would rapidly turn French territory into a bloody battlefield. America can lose the battle of Europe, he noted with bitterness, without disappearing and French generals and civilians at the, at the Ministry of Defense 
shared their president's sentiment um, and resentment. They believed that conventional weapons lacked both political and strategic credibility as a deterrent in the case of Berlin. They reasoned that the Kremlin knew that the United States would never escalate a conventional war to a nuclear one unless the Soviets struck first with nuclear weapons. So the problem of Berlin had decisive effects on French military strategy. Unbeknownst to Washington, de Gaulle began formulating the plans that would culminate in the withdrawal of French uh, forces from NATO in 1966. So it's the Berlin crisis that kind of was the catalyst for that um, event uh, many years later. Um, but as long as a direct threat loomed over Berlin, de Gaulle would allow US forces to remain and use French territory for logistical purposes. Beyond that point, he insisted that French territory would not be at US disposal um, unless the Atlantic Alliance was revised along several lines. First, he wanted all US forces and um, logistical support units within France to be under the authority and control of his government, not NATO's supreme commanders. In effect, he planned to reject the NATO framework and revert to bilateral arrangements. He also left open for, for further consideration whether he would allow the storage of um, strategic weapons in France for use by US squadrons in the event of a flare up in Central Europe. Perceived American unilateralism concerning Berlin was also decisive in fueling de Gaulle's determination to build, to develop rather, an independent nuclear capability, a force de frappe. He declared unequivocally that under no circumstances would France put its nuclear weapons at the disposal of NATO. And although the French president recognized that Washington, London, and Paris needed to coordinate nuclear strategy, he insisted on what he called a tripartite body independent of NATO to coordinate Western strategy. And I should say here a word of elaboration about how de Gaulle conceived a foreign policy. Um, when I was researching various French foreign ministry files at Quai d'Orsay and in French Foreign Minister Coupe de Merville's private papers, I saw the terms that de Gaulle used for foreign policy realities and troops sprinkled throughout all the documents. The latter term, troops, t and forgive my, my uh, franglais pronunciation, that's T-R-U-C-S, um, this latter term is pejorative for amorphous things. So for de Gaulle, NATO was a partial reality and a partial troop or thing. It was a temporary annoyance, necessary only while de Gaulle maneuvered to implement his grand design for the continent. And I lost my thought here. Give me one second. Um, um, so de Gaulle scorned the other continental nations that accepted a U.S. military protectorate. For de Gaulle, NATO was simply a means for the United States um, to maintain its dominance and attempts by the United States to accommodate and, and circumvent French nationalist aspirations were rather difficult because de Gaulle frequently conflated his aims and his tactics. At times, he would posit demands for, for tripartism as a means of reorganizing NATO in order to achieve French participation in nuclear targeting and strategy. Yet at other times, tripartism was an end in itself because it conferred great power status. Likewise, French possession of a force de frappe constituted both a role and a capability. De Gaulle strove to ensure France's security and influence in world affairs primarily through this development of an independent nuclear capability. Yet in the same way that he insisted on, on tripartism, um, he often framed his pursuit of a force de frappe in symbolic terms as the keystone to his foreign policy. His detractors felt that he simply believed the syllogism that great nations have nuclear weapons, France is a great nation, and therefore France must have nuclear weapons. Um, in other respects, de Gaulle was convinced that a nuclear arsenal would provide uh, political and diplomatic leverage as a force to persuasion that could end the humiliation of stationing US troops on French soil or permit um, strategic independence between the superpowers. The French also believed that a force de frappe would ensure um, 
its supremacy on the continent. And by solidifying um, the kind of burgeoning Franco-German rapprochement, um, France, France with a force to frop would be the dominant continental partner while supposedly satisfying West German nuclear um, ambitions by offering it protection. So the main point I'm trying to make and why I dwell on all of this is that de Gaulle's strategic formulations were driven and accelerated by the ongoing Berlin problem. The Berlin Wall, as we heard Hope say, was not built overnight, nor even in several months. And as construction went on and East Germans attempted to escape, Berlin continued to be a very dangerous place throughout the early 1960s and well beyond. The tactical differences that arose between France and the United States um, over how best to shape a credible deterrent to the Soviets had a divisive impact on relations between the two allies and far-reaching implications for the Western alliance as a whole. First, it did heighten Adenauer's fears of abandonment, which facilitated de Gaulle's strategy of tying West Germany more firmly to France, the first steps being the 1963 Franco-German Treaty of Friendship and, then, and also a French veto of Britain's common market bid. The growing Franco-German Entente thwarted the formulation of a NATO strategic doctrine based on graduated uh, responses ranging from conventional to tactical um, and strategic nuclear levels. On one occasion, Kennedy exclaimed in exasperation to the French ambassador, quote, that, Frank, that great Franco-German Entente, we are always subject to very sharp criticism by the Germans for not doing one thing or another, but we're doing everything we committed to under NATO and France isn't even fulfilling its NATO commitment. Because under NATO policy director directives, MC 70 and 26 slash four, France was committed to contributing four divisions, but produced only two and a third. And just as bad from the US perspective, um, the West German requirement of 750,000 armed forces needed to fulfill its commitment um, under MC 26 slash 40 also failed to materialize. In short, the problem of Berlin created an insurmountable obstacle to making Kennedy's declarations of a shift in NATO strategy to flexible response a reality, um, an actual implementation of such a doctrine. Um, Kennedy articulated his rationale for flexible response to, to um, his predecessor Eisenhower in a very colorful quote that I will share with you here. He says, quote, when we have this problem of maintaining our position in Berlin, where you may be using sort of gradually escalating force to maintain yourself in Berlin, you can't suddenly begin to drop nuclear weapons the first time you have a difficulty. And it's a very valid reason for our emphasizing the necessity of the West Europeans building up conventional forces. You can't go up the Audubon waving an atom bomb and say the first time a bridge is blown out in front of you, you can't begin a nuclear exchange with the Soviet Union over getting to Berlin, unquote. But due in part to French and West German opposition, the so-called flexible response made during at least the Kennedy um, period in the theoretical realm, rather than becoming actual adopted NATO strategy. In some, due in no small measure to the never ending Berlin problem, mistrust permeated both the Atlantic Alliance as well as East-West relations. Kennedy believed that if the West probed the Soviets for arrangements over Berlin and the security of Central Europe, then the Allies could create an atmosphere for resolving Cold War disputes. Yet those very contentious issues, primarily Berlin and the overall German question, polarized the NATO alliance and generated perpetual East-West enmity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mann. Dr. Schwartz. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I want to thank uh, Ingo and Seth, uh, but also Connie, who handled a lot of the arrangements here today. I'm very honored to be here, especially to be on a panel with um, uh, my friends uh, Hope and Aaron. Um, just a, a quick note, Aaron's uh, forthcoming book is really excellent on so many issues related to uh, 
to now and uh, different types of warfare that we've dealt with during the Nixon years. Um, I do regret the fact that we're not in person. Uh, I, uh, um, uh, I had a very memorable experience in Athens, Georgia now some 33 years ago. Um, it was the first opportunity to meet John Gaddis in person. And because John Gaddis was there, he also brought along George Kennan, and my one and only opportunity to meet George Kennan as well. I also met Condoleezza Rice there, uh, which is a funny story, but I won't go into it. But most importantly, I also met Vlad Zubak, uh, who is on today's afternoon panel, who uh, has been such an incredible uh, uh, person in our field uh, over this, these last years. Um, the title of my presentation is Between Freedom Symbol and Causus Belli, uh, Berlin in the Johnson and Nixon Years. And I start out with two quotations, uh, one from uh, the historian Andy Daum, who um, I think wrote a great book on Kennedy's relationship with Berlin, who wrote, in the eyes of many Americans, the defense of Berlin was a glowing example of the country fulfilling its mission to advance freedom worldwide. But I have a second quote from uh, Dean Rusk uh, that he uh, uh, gave at one point, Europeans, quote, were not innocent bystanders in the Cold War. They were the issue. The United States was not going to fight the Soviet Union about polar bears in the Arctic. It would go to war over Europe. Now, the city of Berlin, located deep within the communist territory that became East Germany, was the most profound symbol of the ideological divide of the Cold War. From the Russian blockade and Western airlift to the building of the wall and Soviet and American tanks facing each other near Checkpoint Charlie, there was no more dangerous yet inspiring place for Americans in the superpower struggle over the future. When John, President John F. Kennedy proclaimed, Ich bin ein Berliner, his Boston accented German stirred tumultuous cheers from a massive crowd in the former German capital city, but it also connected emotionally with his own countrymen as well clarifying the distinction between the free world and a communist system that required a wall to keep its people in. The great irony of this was that the Kennedy administration had been trying to find a formula to diffuse the crisis status of the city, a negotiating process that only came to an end after the Cuban Missile Crisis. Even during that crisis, President Kennedy had speculated at first that Nikita Khrushchev's purpose in Cuba was to trade the Caribbean country for Berlin. Now, the argument I'm going to make in the paper and that I make in I will make in the article for this book is that both the Johnson and Johnson, Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon administrations faced a policy dilemma over Berlin. On the one hand, they wish to preserve the freedom of the western half of the city as the symbolic capital of the West in the Cold War, a city whose separation by its ugly wall perfectly represented the ideological struggle in a clear, good and evil manner. As Kennedy himself had put it when describing how some had talked about communism as the wave of the future or the progress made under communism, let them come to Berlin. For Germans standing firm in Berlin also represented the ultimate hope for reunification rather than permanent division. On the other hand, both Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon wanted to lower the temperature of the Cold War and move towards some type of detente, a complex process in which the division of Germany and Berlin would have to be recognized and in which the national interests of the United States and its German ally might not coincide. Central to that process would be an arrangement over Berlin, an arrangement that would regulate its status, maintain the freedom of the Western sector, but prevent it again from becoming a possible source of direct military conflict between the superpowers. The solution to this dilemma would be the Quadripartite Agreement of September 1971, whose 50th anniversary was recently noted, but is one of the least heralded, but most important international agreements of the Cold War. So first I'll deal with the Johnson administration in Berlin. As Vice President Lyndon Johnson had traveled to Berlin shortly after the wall was built and told some 300,000 Berliners at City Hall that America's commitment to Berlin was the same as our ancestors uh, pledged in forming the United States, our lives, our fortune, and our sacred honor. However, by the time he became president after John Kennedy's assassination, the Cold War had changed. The Cuban Missile Crisis brought the United States and the Soviet Union closer to nuclear war than they had ever been, 
And in the aftermath of that crisis, President Kennedy had taken steps to decrease the risk of conflict. Johnson observed how Kennedy's limited nuclear test ban treaty, signed in August of 63, had boosted the president's popularity. And he was determined to continue Kennedy's attempt to reach agreements with the Soviet Union. Although he pledged to keep faith with existing treaty commitments, quote, from South Vietnam to West Berlin, Johnson also told the United Nations General Assembly in 1963 that, quote, the United States of America wants to see the Cold War end. And one of Johnson's first successes in Congress came with the Christmas Eve passage of a bill allowing the sale of wheat to the Soviet Union. Christmas 1963 also brought with it one of the first openings in the Berlin Wall, as the PASS program allowed thousands of West Germans to visit relatives in East Berlin. Over the holidays, Johnson also hosted German Chancellor Ludwig Erhard at his ranch in Texas and told Erhard that the United States was going down the road to peace with or without others and asked the chancellor to be more flexible than his predecessor in dealings with the Soviet Union. Johnson made a point of emphasizing how Konrad Adenauer had repeatedly warned him about trusting the Russians, but that Adenauer's position was, in Johnson's words, too rigid, and that he didn't want the rest of the world to think that only the Russians wanted peace. Johnson's approach accepted, acquired the name of bridge building, a term he would use in a May 64 speech that spoke of the need to, quote, build bridges across the Gulf, which has divided us from Eastern Europe. One target of Johnson's approach was the Hallstein Doctrine, which compelled the German government to break relations with any nation that recognized East Germany. Erhard pushed back about the Hallstein Doctrine, but he and his foreign minister, Gerhard Schroeder, pursued what they termed as the policy of movement, aimed at reducing suspicions about Germany and Eastern Europe, and focused on trade agreements. Erhard also courted Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev, whose son-in-law, Alexei Ajubi, visited Bonn in July 1964 for talks. This paved the way for Erhard to announce that Khrushchev himself would visit the Federal Republic, but the Soviet leader was ousted in October of 1964 before the visit took place. Lyndon Johnson genuinely liked Ludwig Erhard and considered him his favorite European leader. Now, there wasn't much to choose from on that front. He met frequently with Erhard over the first three years of his presidency, though the discussions increasingly focused on Vietnam and what the Germans could do to help the United States with the expensive costs of, of the escalating war in Southeast Asia, as well as its continuing commitment in Europe. Erhard deflected such requests based on Germany's recent history, although allowing for such gestures as deploying a hospital ship and providing other forms of economic aid to the struggling South Vietnamese government. Johnson also pressured Erhard to spend more to offset the costs of American troops in Germany. In one memorable exchange in December of 1965, recorded by the American ambassador to Germany, George McGee, Johnson's, quote, tall, rangy figure towered over the comparatively small figure of the chancellor. Gesticulating and speaking in a strong, strident voice, Johnson alternately wheeled and threatened, frightening the chancellor with his outburst. Erhard's subsequent failure to get a reduction in offset costs from the United States was one factor in his downfall of October 1966. What is striking is that Berlin rarely rated a mention in any of the johnson Erhard talks after their first meeting. The divided city no longer preoccupied decision makers in Washington, and the status quo seemed to suit both countries. As part of its attempt to lower the temperature of the Cold War, the Johnson administration deliberately decided to downplay the observance of the fifth anniversary of the building of the wall in August of 1966. In October of 1966, Johnson gave a major speech on European policy entitled Making Europe Whole, an Unfinished Task. The speech was timed to two anniversaries, the end of the Berlin Airlift and the ratification of the Partial Test Ban Treaty, symbolically representing deterrence and detente. Johnson emphasized, we want the Soviet Union and the nations of Eastern Europe to know that we and our allies shall go step by step with them as far as they are willing to advance. Ironically enough, the speech came only shortly before the grand coalition government of Kurt Kiesinger and Willy Brandt would take office and signal a new direction in German foreign policy. Although Brandt's Ostpolitik began cautiously in the coalition, it reflected a willingness on the part of the German government to move in the direction of better relations with the East and the Soviet Union that the United States had been pursuing. By the late 1960s, West Berlin itself was changing, 
as its demographics and political coloring shifted from Cold War fundamentalism to new left radicalism. It became a haven for young German men avoiding military service. And as Andreas Daum noted, the city offered, quote, for do left and critics of the United States more room for maneuver than anywhere else in West Germany. Vice President Hubert Humphrey's visit to the city in April 1967 encountered a militantly anti-American protest from the extra parliamentary opposition. Shouts of Johnson murderer and Washington go home echoed through the streets. Even more famously, the violence that greeted the Shah of Iran during his visit to Berlin in June 67, which led to the shooting of a German student, also seemed to indicate that the city was changing dramatically from the one that greeted President Kennedy only four years earlier. In fact, while the majority of West Berliners still supported the Atlantic Alliance, the close emotional ties of the city to the United States were fraying. In June 1968, after the assassination of Senator Robert F. Kennedy, student organizations refused to participate in any memorial services, a striking contrast to their role five years earlier. The polarization of the city did not substantially dissipate even after the Soviet Union invaded Czechoslovakia and seemed to put an end to bridge building the hope that the Cold War was coming to a quick end and that the superpowers hold over their part of Europe was dissolving. Now I wanna move into the Nixon administration's policies. When Richard Nixon was inaugurated as president in January 69, he proclaimed that after a period of confrontation, we are now entering into a period of negotiations. Nixon's reputation as a tough and unreconstructed cold warrior led to considerable skepticism about this assertion but the president understood the mood of the American people and the transformation of the international scene. He was elected, he believed, to end the Vietnam War and scale back America's commitments, especially those involving the military and the possible deployment of American troops. He also recognized the rapid growth of Soviet nuclear capabilities over the course of the 60s had changed the dynamic of the Cold War, creating a genuine balance of terror and instilling doubt about America's commitment to defend Western Europe. Along with his foreign policy advisor, Dr. Henry Kissinger, a German-born Jewish immigrant, Nixon wanted to implement a less expansive and realistic foreign policy that secured America's national interests but limited her sacrifice in blood and treasure. Kissinger, who played a key role in explaining foreign policy to journalists, argued that, quote, we have no permanent enemies and that we will judge other countries on the basis of their actions, not on the basis of their domestic ideology. This new realism was also the theme of the administration's first annual report of United States foreign policy issued in February of 1970 and designed to convey Nixon and Kissinger's new approach to foreign policy to match a new era in international relations. Almost immediately on entering office, Nixon and Kissinger faced a potential crisis in Berlin. The Federal Republic planned to hold its Federal Assembly to elect a new president of the Republic. Given the contested nature of West Berlin as a sovereign part of West Germany, the decision to hold the assembly there was a strong policy statement and potential provocation by the Kiesinger government. Even though the presidency was largely a ceremonial office with little power, the East German government protested vehemently and the Soviet Union supported its position. The East Germans began harassing traffic between West Germany and West Berlin. Now Nixon wanted his first trip abroad to be to Western Europe, an area he regarded as blue chip compared to the rest of the world. And at that time, a trip by an American president to Europe um, would be incomplete without a trip to West Berlin. And even though Nixon worried about comparisons with his charismatic predecessor, Kennedy, he arrived in Berlin only a few days before the scheduled General Assembly election on February 27, 1969. Prior to his arrival, Nixon had used Kissinger's back channel with the Soviet ambassador Anatoly Dobrynin to make it clear to the Soviets that a new crisis over Berlin or anything approaching another blockade would have a serious impact on his willingness to enter into arms control negotiations or otherwise improve US-Soviet relations. He also had Kissinger convey the idea that there would be no bridge building in his administration and that the US accepted Soviet dominance in Eastern Europe. Now, when he was in Berlin, Nixon did make it a point to stress his commitment to the city no unilateral quote, no unilateral move, no illegal act, no form of pressure from any source will shake the resolve of Western nations to defend their rightful status as protectors of the people of free Berlin. In words less eloquent than Kennedy's, but also less dangerous, 
Nixon argued that if this is an age of symbols, one of the great symbols of the age is the city. However, Nixon then pleaded to his listeners to set behind us, quote, the stereotype of Berlin as a provocation, and that the question now is how best to end the challenge and clear the way for a peaceful solution to the problem of a divided Germany. Taking a cue from Kennedy, but changing the words in an important fashion, Nixon closed his speech by saying, quote, in the sense that the people of Berlin stand for freedom and peace, all the people of the world are truly Berliners. Now, Nixon's speech was an early indication that he and Kissinger were theoretically ready to negotiate new arrangements on Berlin. But this was not an urgent priority of the administration. The administration was dealing with Vietnam, nuclear weapons talks with the Soviets, and trying to open a channel to communist China. It would take the German elections of September 1969 to force Nixon and Kissinger to reconsider their approach to Berlin and Germany. Germany's Social Democrats narrowly prevailed in the election and came to power in a coalition with the Liberal Democrats for the first time in post-war history. Willy Brandt, the famous and charismatic mayor of West Berlin, took office as chancellor with the determination to accelerate the Ostpolitik he had begun as foreign minister. Brandt's key advisor, Egon Barr, visited the United States and told Kissinger that Germany would now be more self-reliant and not always compliant toward the U.S., signaling, in effect, that the Germans would practice their own form of informing rather than consulting with the United States. Kissinger told Barr that America wanted to deal with Germany as a partner, not a client. But these words belied the real concerns about Brandt taking the leadership of Europe and unleashing, quote, a detente euphoria at a time when the United States, frustrated by its lack of success in its attempts to get Soviet help on Vietnam, found its own movement toward better relations with the Russians bogged down. Nixon's deep distaste for Brandt, a figure who reminded him of the Kennedys and whose socialist policies he despised, only complicated matters for Kissinger, as he found himself explaining his former countrymen's policies to his unsympathetic boss. Over the next several months, despite private misgivings, frequent predictions of failure, and constant appeals from Germany's political opposition to intervene, the United States found itself essentially led by its West German ally. Brandt's determination to move in directions which earlier administrations, had, earlier American administrations had suggested, including the recognition of the Odenaisa border with Poland, exchanges with East Germany, and talks with Moscow, accelerated the movement far more quickly than the Nixon administration plan, a movement toward a European detente. For achieving treaties with Moscow and Poland, Billy Brandt was Times Man of the Year in 1970, a designation which greatly irritated Nixon. Kissinger's own analysis of the process reflected an acute and pessimistic understanding of the dynamics of German domestic politics, which found Brandt facing enormous pressures to produce results in a very short period of time. Not surprising given his own personal experience with Germany, Kissinger also feared that Brandt's efforts might rekindle a debate, a debate about Germany's basic position within the West, not only inflaming German domestic affairs, but generating suspicions among Germany's Western associates as to its reliability as a partner. He also feared a resurgence of German nationalism, a fear he would express often to associates, even though Brandt seemed anything but a nationalist. But Kissinger feared the unintended results of Brandt's policies, especially if they might lead to greater demands for reunification outside of the Western European framework. As he concluded in one memo to Nixon, Brandt's problem is to control a process which, if it results in failure, could jeopardize their political lives, and if it succeeds, could create a momentum that may shake Germany's domestic stability and unhinge its international position. Kissinger's mistrust of Brandt and the direction of Ostpolitik found a sympathetic listener in Nixon. When Brandt traveled to East Germany and Kissinger wrote of, quote, the dim prospects for success of the talks, Nixon wrote in the margins of the memo, quote, if Brandt continues in this soft-headed line, this would be on our interest. And the president continually hoped Brandt's government would collapse. Kissinger considered Brandt, quote, not the brightest man in the world, unquote, and spoke disdainfully of the reptile Barr, um, who he uh, frequently uh, 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 expressed displeasure with. Um, I have a, my own suspicion that Kissinger was listening in on Barr's phone calls and other efforts during this time. I can't prove that, but I, I have that suspicion uh, that American intelligence, uh, as it did with Angela Merkel, was, was listening in on its allies. 
Despite his personal feelings, no doubt intensified by his family's experience with German nationalism, Kissinger approached German policy with great care and made sure that Nixon's frequent emotional outbursts had no real effect on policy. Nixon and Kissinger did make various attempts to slow down the momentum of Bronstow's politique. In December 1970, Kissinger secretly organized a group of Cold War American senior diplomats with close ties to Germany, including Dean Acheson, Lucius Clay, and John McCloy, to visit Nixon in the White House and complain publicly about Germany's mad race to Moscow. Kissinger told Acheson beforehand that he hoped they could make some concrete suggestions about leadership we could exercise in Europe right now in respect to Ostpolitik, which Kissinger told uh, Acheson, I think is a disaster. Brandt is sincere, but there are a lot of sincere fools in the world, Kissinger went on to say. The fact that Kissinger's role in the Acheson visit remained hidden allowed him to distance himself from the critique that Acheson made and to meet with German State Secretary Horst MK two weeks later. MK wanted the Americans to intensify the Berlin talks, which had been underway earlier in the year. Kissinger was now receptive to the offer for a number of interconnected reasons. His bureaucratic battles with Secretary of State William Rogers were increasingly successful, and Kissinger had become Nixon's key advisors on the most important foreign policy issues. Berlin could now be added to that list. In addition, Kissinger interpreted the food riots, which had broken out in Poland after the signing of the Warsaw Treaty, and as, event, as an event that might push the Soviets toward detente with the United States. He was also aware that China had signaled its own interest in a possible meeting with the Americans. Kissinger believed now, as he told MK, that the Germans could not jeopardize our interest in Europe without jeopardizing their own. In January of 1971, Soviet Ambassador Anatoly Dobrynin made it clear to Kissinger that the Soviets were interested in a summit with the United States and that they hoped to make an objective improvement in the Berlin situation. The fact that the Soviets were willing to use the secret back channel with Kissinger to help hammer out a Berlin agreement appealed to the national security advisor who knew how much Nixon wanted foreign policy successes for his domestic political situation. To Kissinger, it seemed as though he could now control the negotiations. He told Dobrynin, quote, Barr would tell me what the German government might be willing to consider. I would discuss it with Dobrynin. If the three of us agreed, we would introduce it first in the four power Western group and subsequently in the four power talks in Berlin. Over the next months, the Berlin negotiations proceeded on these two levels, officially on the ambassadorial level with the four major powers and secretly during meetings of the US ambassador, Kenneth Rush, the Soviet ambassador, Valentin Fallon and Brandt's aide, Egon Barr. They referred to themselves as the three musketeers. Rush was the one participant in both sets of talks as Kissinger called him the linchpin. Rush, Kissinger wrote, kept me brief for my negotiations with Dobrynin. He kept in close touch with the other Western allies to make sure that the allied positions remained compatible. He also had to curb Barr's propensity for solitary efforts and for claiming credit with the Soviets for all concessions made. Although Kissinger would also connect Berlin with other parts of his complicated diplomacy during this period, on Berlin, he acknowledged that the process worked, quote, due in large measure to Russia's unflappable skill. And Kissinger's willingness to give so much credit to Rush for a foreign policy achievement in the Nixon administration is noteworthy, largely because it is so out of character. Ironically enough, the Berlin negotiations proceeded rapidly as the Brandt government facing a continual challenge from the conservative opposition was desperate to speed up acceptance of the Moscow and Warsaw treaties, which were now linked to a Berlin agreement. The only way was to push ahead, and Egon Barr wanted to focus on practicalities rather than legal issues. As Barr told Kissinger, the way to break the deadlock was to get away from judicial arguments and stress only the obligations and undertakings of each side. The negotiations accelerated as the fruits of Nixon and Kissinger's triangular diplomacy were starting to become apparent. The end of April 1971, the US received the official word that the Chinese government would receive an envoy from the United States for negotiations. In May, the US and the Soviet Union agreed to the start of a negotiation for a strategic arms limitation treaty, the SALT talks, which would culminate in the summit. For his part, Kissinger quite deliberately slowed the pace of the Berlin negotiations before his trip to China, telling Rush on June 28, 1971, that it was imperative that you do not come to a final agreement until after July 15th for reasons that will become apparent to you. Nixon's announcement on July 15th of his trip to China shocked the nation, but was greeted with an overwhelmingly favorable response. 
although it did unsettle the Soviets, there is no compelling evidence that it altered in any fundamental way the quadripartite agreement, which was signed September 3rd, 1971. To close, the dilemma that had faced American leaders, maintaining Berlin's symbolic value while reducing its potential to trigger a conflict with the Soviet Union, seemed at first to be largely decided in favor of the latter objective. Even though the quadripartite agreement never actually mentioned the city of Berlin by name, it did serve to stabilize West Berlin's position and guarantee practical improvement in the lives of its residents. While it did increase the Soviet presence in the city and decrease West Germany's political presence, the legal rights of the Western Allies remained and the city survived, albeit with a substantial subsidy from Bonn. Critics at the time did focus on the increased Soviet presence in West Berlin, as well as the Allies' failure to gain any concessions on East Berlin. However, 18 years later, when East Berlin party leader Gunter Schabowski announced that travel restrictions were being lifted, it would be in Berlin where the Cold War came to its symbolic end. To that extent, Western leaders had managed to resolve the dilemma of Berlin as a symbol and possible trigger to war in a way that preserved the peace and brought an advance of freedom. Such achievements are relatively rare in history, and this one deserves our recognition and praise. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to uh, to all three of you for, for these, these excellent talks. I'd actually taken together also, uh, I think, paint a pretty full picture uh, of, of the period from really the early to mid 1950s uh, up to the, the early 70s and, and, and the aftermath. We have uh, just a few minutes for questions and I'm gonna maybe summarize a few things that, that I've collected. Um, there is a, a, a sort of a confluence of, of very intense crisis, it seems in 1961 and then the turn to change, to reform, to, 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 to more engagement. Um, is that, in a sense, a direct response to 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 how close uh, the, the the leaders felt that they might have come to war at that point? I would I would argue yes. I, I do think uh, there was the sense that this this is a very very dangerous situation and we need to uh, uh, deal with it. That, that didn't mean Berlin was a constant source of psychological warfare during the Cold War. Uh, but the goal, I think, uh, particularly after the Cuban Missile Crisis, was, was to figure out a way to maintain that without um, getting close to a any sort of incident that would lead to um, a, a conflict. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with Tom. Um, I, I think Berlin was different than other places because I know in the Kennedy Kennedy's mind and that of his advisors, it was a miscalculation or kind of unintended consequences that could spiral and, and, and lead to, to war. Um, it didn't really fit into that mutually assured destruction model that um, you associate with McNamara and the Kennedy administration. It was um, more kind of like, I think, Tom, you just said, like a thorn in the side um, that could, um, could just get out of control. And I would add to that on the East German side, um, they increasingly throughout the 60s uh, realized that they could trade movement across the border for Deutschmarks, that they could get Western money uh, if they allowed more movement. And so, you know, they too were interested in um, the West German. German overtures while always trying to limit how much that would mean influencing the lives and visions of East German citizens. Thank you. Um, there's another question on, 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 I guess we would call it soft power, that is, you know, what influenced it Western, West German, and, and and for that matter, West Berlin intellectuals have on on shaping perceptions in the U.S. Uh, scholars that 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 visited the U.S. student exchanges and and cultural exchange in that sense in general. Berlin did remain, uh, you know, the Aspen Institute located one of its centers in Berlin. There was certainly an effort by members of the foreign policy establishment. Here, I'm referring to Shepard Stone who was very active in this, uh, to, to keep Berlin at the center of things intellectually and to have people aware of uh, 
uh, Berlin and its its position, even as tensions there ratcheted down. Um, I'm not sure on the other side uh, to what extent uh, this this had the the Berliners uh, Berlin intellectuals. Uh, perhaps Aaron or Hope could speak to that. Well, I'm going to let you field this one. Okay, um, I can't comment on the intellectuals, but I can say, following up exactly with what Tom said, is that the West Berlin government started a program where they, and I'm not sure when they started it, but I was a beneficiary of it in 1989. In fact, in November 1989, uh, the West Berlin government had a program that brought so-called young leaders from the U.S., um, and that meant actually Harvard and Stanford <laughs> graduate students uh, brought them to the city of West Berlin each year for 10 days to, to hope that they could convince these people to see how important West Berlin was to have a connection to West Berlin and that if any of us ever rose to positions of power, that we would make sure we would defend West Berlin. So I was on that exchange as it happened. We left New York City, headed for West Berlin on November 9th, 1989. So the wall fell while I was on the plane and I was there for 10 days after the wall fell. Good, good timing. Um, we, we have exhausted our time, but I, I wanted to raise one one uh, thread that, that really stood out to me in all three presentations, which is, I mean, we often assume this this sort of top-down, you know, superpowers decide, everyone else follows kind of kind of dynamism, right? Um, but I think in in all three papers, there's a very strong shaping of events, often negatively in a sense, uh, by by negative pressure, I guess one one would say, in within both both blocks. Uh, that that I found that really. Uh, really striking because I think especially when it comes to to policy lessons um, that, that those tend to be overlooked actors and I, I really appreciate how how strongly that came to the fore uh, e even if all of them were seen as ornery uh, over <laughs> in Moscow and de Gaulle and and, and Brandt in in uh, uh, in Washington well thank you uh, uh, all three very much also thank you Seth uh, and uh, uh, we reconvene at 1 30 for our third panel where we, well, we don't exactly leave the Cold War behind, but we start thinking about the end of it uh, and uh, visions uh, at the end uh, on, on both sides of the diminishing or disappearing Iron Curtain, what the future might look like. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.